Welcome and good evening, everyone. Good, evening. good to see you all back here. And uh, I am excited to share with you on a topic that I think is very, very important. I mean, they all are important, but uh, one that I think has led to a lot of damage, unfortunately, to people's view of God. So I really, really want to ask for God to bless us and uh, grant us an extra special measure of His grace and His presence this evening. So let's pray. Oh, sweet Jesus, thank you for this privilege to come into your presence, to pray uh, that you long to hear from us, and Lord, that you long to bless us even more than we have the courage to ask. But I am praying for a blessing this evening. I'm praying that you would speak to us, that you would help us to see your true character of love in the midst of a difficult, difficult topic. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to address the second part of what we began on Wednesday night regarding what happens when people die. Uh, we covered largely what happens with the righteous. We talked about the, par- the process of heaven and what that looks like. And when people go, we're affirming the existence of heaven. We're not denying that to make sure that's abundantly clear. We do believe in the biblical teaching of heaven. The timing is the issue of what we talked about that happens at the second coming and afterwards. Uh, what we're going to be addressing this evening is now the topic of hell. Uh, what happens whenever people uh, will eventually receive that judgment? When does it happen? What does it look like? We're going to walk through all of that this evening. So these are, again, events that extend from the second coming of Jesus. They're all kind of interwoven here. Okay? So Jesus says this, and we talked about this more than once, but if there's anybody that we can trust when it comes to their view of doctrine, it's Jesus. Amen? When we're struggling to know what to believe, even if we've heard things from some people, we're like, man, like I've always known this, but now you're saying that. As long as we're looking at Jesus and listening to Jesus, there's safety and refuge there. Amen? Not in people, right? We're putting our trust in the sacred scriptures and in the teachings of Jesus. So Jesus says this. He says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice, and they'll come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. By the way, this is John 5, 28 and 29. So what Jesus is implying here is that there are two separate resurrections. Do we see that from the text? There's a resurrection for the righteous and a resurrection of condemnation. These do not happen at the same time. Okay, And so that's going to be two separate scenarios, two different uh, events. So a resurrection of life, a resurrection of condemnation... At the second coming of Jesus, there's going to be four classes of people, okay? Those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ. And both of those parties rise up into the skies to meet Jesus in the clouds. That's those two parties. Then we have another two parties, those who are alive and outside of Christ when he comes, and those who died outside of Christ before he came. Those are the four classes of people. We'll address their circumstances in just a moment, but you're with me so far? Four classes of people, those alive that were righteous and those who were dead that were righteous at the second coming, that party all goes up into heaven with Jesus at that stage. We covered that part at the second coming. We'll address the second two in just a moment, okay? We're told this again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And then the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay? So we, this is just refresh. We dealt with that in our previous meetings. So this covers the righteous living and the righteous dead. What about the next party? Psalm 97, beginning in verse 1, gives a picture of what the second coming will look like and what happens on earth, and particularly shining a light that 1 Thessalonians did not. Uh, What happens to the other people that are on earth at that stage? So it says this, Psalm 97, beginning in verse 1, The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. His lightnings light the world. Hey, we heard language like that before, didn't we? Remember that from Matthew chapter 24? Jesus equated his second coming as lightning from the east to the west. Well, we're given more information in Psalm 97 that the very brightness of Christ's coming for those who are outside of Christ will literally destroy them. Okay? 
And we'll go into more of the details on this in just a moment, but this is what we're told in the details, that they're destroyed at the brightness of His coming, those who are outside of Christ but were alive at the second coming. Is lightnings like the world, the earth sees and trembles. Verse 5, the mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. So it's making a very clear statement here that when Jesus comes, the earth itself freaks out. Okay, it, it's a very powerful and even somewhat traumatic experience for the earth itself when Jesus comes. And it's a very powerful, powerful scenario. And it says, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the people shall see his glory. Jesus also said this in Matthew chapter 24 and other places that he's coming in the glory of his father and in the glory of the angels. Okay, these are talking about the same scenario, the same story. Okay, so this covers the wicked living, those who are lost, who are living at the second coming of Jesus. But what about those people who died before Jesus comes that were outside of Christ? Okay, we've dealt with the righteous, the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive or remain and are righteous will be caught up together with them. That class is covered. We now have seen what happens to those who are outside of Christ, who are alive at the second coming, and they're destroyed by the brightness of His coming. Now, what happens with that fourth party, those who are dead outside of Christ when Jesus comes? In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, it says this, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon. Now, does anyone remember who the dragon represents in the book of Revelation? Does anybody remember who that was? Satan. Satan. Okay. So Satan here is going to be bound. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? A thousand years. Maybe you've heard of the idea of the millennium. Maybe you've heard somebody talk about Bible prophecy and end time events, and there's a, maybe a millennium of peace or something else. This thousand years is that time period that's alluded to, but it may look a little different maybe than you've heard. And he cast him, the dragon, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more for how long? until after the thousand years have finished. So he's going to be in this prison cell of sorts. We'll explain what that looks like in a moment for a thousand years. So when Jesus comes, when the second coming happens, as soon as Jesus takes the righteous with him up into heaven, that begins the clock for that thousand year period. Okay. Those who were dead outside of Christ remain dead. Those who were alive and outside of Christ at the second coming are slain. Okay, so there is literally, the earth is, is vacant at this stage. Okay, so you shall deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished, but after these things, he must be released for a while. So after the thousand years are finished, he will be released. Okay, so here's the point. The imagery in Revelation is many times symbolic. Okay, it's symbolic. The devil isn't literally a dragon, right? It symbolizes many different things. The chain that binds Satan here is one of circumstances. It's a circumstantial chain. How is he bound? How is he isolated? There's no one to tempt. It's literally just him and the third of the angels that were cast out with him from heaven. They're the only ones alive on the surface of the earth. The animals have been killed. Like there's nothing. There's nothing going on. It's just a desolate earth. In fact, the language that's used here in verse 1 where it says the bottomless pit is the word abusos in the Greek. Now, in Jesus' day, they had the Old Testament. It was written in Hebrew, largely. There's another language involved, but largely it's predominantly Hebrew. But people in his day didn't read Hebrew, some of them. They read Greek. And so there was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Just like you and I, the, the Bible wasn't written in English. We have a translation of that in our readable tongue. Same thing happened in Jesus' day. When they had the Greek version of the Old Testament, when it says in the book of Genesis that the earth was, out, was without form and void, that's the same language in the Greek that's used right here in Revelation chapter 20, and verse 1. When it says the bottomless pit, Basically, Satan is on an earth that's without form and void, just like it was at creation before God created. It's a desolate, sacked earth at this stage. There's no people to tempt because those who were outside of Christ at the second coming were slain that were alive, and those who were outside of Christ that were dead just remained dead. They remained sleeping, okay? And the righteous are in heaven. So there's no one for him to tempt. That's what's being alluded to here in Revelation chapter 20. He's bound by a chain of circumstances for a thousand years that he's isolated. You ever have your parents tell you, go to your room and think about what you did? 
You ever been in that type of situation where it's just you left alone with your thoughts and what you did and what you caused? Now, God's not shaming Satan here, but it's a similar scenario in the sense that he has a thousand years to reflect upon all the havoc he's causing. Guys, this has gone on for a while, a good minute, that this world has been dealing with hardship and difficulty, and Satan is going to be ruminating now for a thousand years over the harm that he's caused. Okay? And, all right, continuing to verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat of them, speaking of the righteous, and judgment was committed to them. So now we're given insight into what's happening with the righteous, those first two classes of people. They are in heaven, and it says that judgment was committed to them. Now, Daniel chapter 7 alludes to this idea that the books were opened, that they were, there's an examination happening. The books of heaven, the book of life is being examined, and all the righteous are going to find out why things have happened as they have. We've got a thousand years to just ask God the questions we've always wanted to ask. Why is so-and-so not in heaven right now? Why is it that you didn't kill the devil immediately? Every question that you would have that's on your heart and everything in particular that's surrounding the judgment that's to come after the thousand years, when God will destroy the wicked, we will have ample time to examine what God has done, what God is about to do, and we will render a judgment in stating that what God has done and will do is holy, righteous, just, and good. Does that make sense? We literally will have a full thousand years to ask every one of those burning questions on your hearts, those things that seemed unjust, those things that seemed unfair, those things that seemed so mysterious. God will let us go through that. So when it says that judgment was committed to them, the saints are now given an opportunity to examine all the decisions that God has made, and they will declare, all of your ways are just, O God. Amen? And I love this, that God is so reasonable. God could just do what He wants, but He doesn't do that. God is desperate to be understood, and He wants your trust. And so He gives us that thousand years to work through all of what has happened and what's about to happen so that we will have perfect peace at the end of the day. I really appreciate this about God. Then it says, Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. We'll deal with that topic at a later time. And they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? For a thousand years. And then the original, well, I say the original language, the, the English translations don't catch this, but a parenthetical statement is made next. Okay, and I'll explain why here in just a moment. But what happens in the beginning of verse 5 is a parenthetical statement because everything's talking about the righteous here. The righteous are examining, right? They're rendering a judgment. They're living with God. They didn't receive the mark of the beast. They're living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And then there's this brief parenthetical statement, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. They're just letting you know, well, what about everybody else? They speak into that space, and then that parenthetical statement closes, and then the verse ends by saying, this is the first resurrection. Now, why do I say that? Because verse 5, the beginning of it, is not talking about the first resurrection. When it says, the rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years are finished, that's not talking about the first resurrection. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's a brief parenthetical statement. Here's what's going on with those who did have the first resurrection, those who were resurrected at Jesus' coming or who were translated at at the second coming of Jesus. That's the first resurrection. That's for the righteous. They're in heaven. That's what's going on. They're reigning with Christ for a thousand years. But these other people, they're not waking up for another thousand years. Now, back to the point that we were making, everything that you heard previously is regarding the first resurrection. Does that make sense? Okay, that's what's being said here. The rest of the wicked don't live again until the thousand years are over. This is the second resurrection. Remember, Jesus said the resurrection of the righteous and then a resurrection of condemnation. Now, this is very, very important. And I think this, again, shines a light on the fairness and the mercy and justice of God. Remember, all of the righteous receive their reward at the same time. Do you remember that from a previous presentation in Hebrews 11? He's, it, it, Paul, uh, I believe it's Paul, but whoever you want to believe is the author of the book of Hebrews. There's questions that some people have. But the author of Hebrews says that they did not receive the promise because they were not going to be made perfect without us, all those champions of faith in the Old Testament. 
Everyone receives their reward at the exact same time. That's the case for the righteous. What we're about to see is the same as the case for the wicked. They're all resurrected a second time. They will come face to face with what's transpired, and then they're going to receive their judgment. Okay? They'll die the second death. Picking up in verse 6, we'll see this. Blessed and holy is he who takes part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. So they died a first death, unless they were translated to the second coming of Jesus. We're all going to die. If Jesus doesn't come before we breathe our last breath, all of us will die once, right? With the exception of those who are translated. But the second death is for those who are going to go through the, the, the resurrection of condemnation. Right? Because everyone who was alive that was outside of Christ at the second coming of Jesus is slain. Right? So they have died once. And the people who died before Jesus came clearly died once already. And they're all sleeping until the thousand years are finished. They're resurrected in the second resurrection chronologically. And they will experience a second death, which is a complete destruction. Does that make sense so far? Are you kind of following with me here in the chronology of how this works? Okay? So over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And again, they'll reign with them for a thousand years. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, what was his prison? Do you remember? The bottomless pit. And that was explaining that it was a form of circumstances, right? that his, his bondage was circumstantial because there was no one attempt. He can't leave planet Earth. He's spending a thousand years in time out, if you will, a really hard one, to think about what he's done. So when it says that he's released from his prison, the circumstances have changed. Now, going back to verse 4, it says, uh, sorry, in verse 5, the rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years are finished. Who are the rest of the dead? The wicked. Okay, so when it says now that after the thousand years have expired, Satan's released from his prison, verse 5 tells us that means the second resurrection has happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, they don't live again until the thousand years are finished. The thousand years are finished and Satan's released from his prison. What that means is these people have all been resurrected. And this is a lot of people. This is literally every lost individual that has ever lived in the history of earth. It's all of them. Okay, And he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Now, I wish I could tell you that everyone who has ever lived is going to heaven. I wish that were the case. And God wishes that more than all of us. But is that going to be the case? No. No. And unfortunately, it's not a small number. There will be many people who rejected the gospel, who rejected the grace of Christ, and that entire population of those who have not received the gospel, who have not received salvation from the fall of Adam and Eve until the second coming of Jesus, that entire population of the lost is now resurrected and on the surface of the earth at that point in time. All of them, okay? So clearly that would be as the sand of the sea. Okay? Now, what they're seeking to do in Revelation chapter 19, then going into Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the new Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21, all three of those kind of forming the same big narrative. The new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven onto planet earth. And it's a big city. The walls are clear as glass. It says that the gold is so clear, it's transparent like glass. And all of the righteous are inside of that city with God, with Jesus, with the tree of life, with the angels. They're inside of that city. And I would encourage you to read these verses, Revelation 19, Revelation 20, Revelation chapter 21. Just read through those chapters. You'll see kind of the big picture narrative, but this is what transpires during that time. So now all of the lost are trying to surround that city, and Satan is the one that's leading this rebellion. Has he led a rebellion before? Yeah. He's led two of them. The one in heaven, and then getting Adam and Eve to fall in the Garden of Eden. This is his last chance. They're seeking to storm the city to get inside of there. The tree of life is there. They're seeking to get into that particular place. And so that, that's the background here, okay? 
um, they're, they're surrounding the city. So just to give a brief uh, recap of kind of the chronology of events, because there's four camps of people, just make sure everyone's clear on what's going on, then we'll cover the last parts of what happens here. So the first resurrection happens at the second coming of Jesus, and who is in the first resurrection, the righteous or the lost? The righteous. The righteous. And where do they go? They go into heaven with Jesus for how long? A years. For a thousand years. Okay. Now, what happens to the people who were lost and were alive when Jesus came the second time, at the second coming? They were destroyed. Okay. Psalm 97, they were destroyed. And those who had already died outside of Christ before he came for the second coming, what happens to them? They just remain asleep, right? They remain in that sleeping state. Then at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released from his prison. Those circumstantial uh, circumstances? Oh, redundancy. Anyway, he's released from his prison of circumstances. And then the thousand, after the thousand years have finished, who is resurrected in the second resurrection? The lost. The lost. And what do they seek to do at this stage? They try to take the city, the Holy Jerusalem, okay? This is kind of the chronology of what happens here, okay? So we've covered these. The dead in Christ rise from their grave and meet Jesus in the air. The alive in Christ are translated to meet him in the clouds. They've got a thousand years to investigate all of what God has done. They're rendering their judgment in it and acknowledging that what God has done is indeed just and right. The dead outside of Christ remain asleep for a thousand years um, until they receive their sentence. The alive outside of Christ are destroyed by His coming and wait also, okay? And again, they're all receiving their punishment at the same time in the same way that the righteous all received their benefit at the same time, their reward, okay? Now, jumping into what the destruction of the wicked looks like. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. Grace, grace, God's grace here. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the reason why Jesus has tarried, why he's delayed his second coming, is because he wants more people to be saved. Does that make sense? He's not forgotten his promise to come again, he's saying here, but he's long-suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? This implies something, though. What does it say is going to happen to the people who are lost? He's not willing that any should perish. Now, what does the word perish mean? To die, right? To not live anymore, to cease living. This is super important because it's very commonly held today that the hell experience is one where when people die, they go into the caverns of the earth, the devil's in charge of it, and they're being tortured for how long? Forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, if they're being tortured forever, are they perishing? No. no. But what did the Bible just say is the fate of the wicked? They perish. So they're not going through this circumstance forever. They will eventually die. This is an important point. John 3, 16 says the same thing. He says, John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's two statements of contrast. You have everlasting life or everlasting burning. Is that what Jesus said? No, he says perish. Does that make sense? This is super important. This is one of those statements that's lost in plain sight that the Bible is stating here that the wicked are destroyed. Remember, it's a resurrection of condemnation. Do not fear him who is able to destroy the body only, but him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Okay, we see this throughout. We'll keep looking at these verses. But the two options are to perish or live forever. Okay, that should be super, super clear. So when does hell happen? Again, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. We know what that prison is. And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they surrounded the camps of the saints in the beloved city. And then it says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? Devoured and devoured them. Now, if you want to know what it means to devour something, invite me to your house for Thai food, right? <laughs> or invite me to your house for Mexican food. 
nothing will be left. It will be fully and completely devoured, right? That's what's being alluded to here. Not, not, not food, obviously, but this idea of completely destroyed, okay? This is where the destruction of the wicked takes place. It's on the surface of the earth, not in the heart of the earth, and it's happening outside of the New Jerusalem, okay? But it's on the surface of the earth, and it's all the wicked at all the same time, okay? Um, and so after the thousand years, they're seeking to destroy the city and fire comes and destroys them. And then God sets up his kingdom on earth at this point in time and the complete eradication of sin takes place. In fact, the very fire that destroys the unrighteous outside of the city also purifies the earth and then God will create a new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 66 alluded to this in our presentation on the Sabbath and we also see this in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. There's a new heaven and a new earth. God creates a new. And what's really awesome about that is the fact that Adam and Eve didn't get to see God create the earth. They were the last ones to the party, but we get to watch God create a new a new heavens and a new earth where no unrighteousness dwells, okay? So this is the picture of what the Bible tells us on when and where hell takes place and how it takes place. Revelation chapter 14, God gives these three angels messages, uh, basically a last message of mercy and warning to the world in the midst of the coming crisis. And we'll cover the coming crisis next week. But it said, Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Okay, this is the full receiving of the wrath of God for the wicked outside of the city. It says, they'll be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And it says, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, some may be saying here, well, that kind of looks like it's happening forever. Well, there's a few things here, and we'll get into this idea of forever action in the next two texts. But the first thing is, just because smoke ascends forever and ever does not mean that fire never stops. How many people have let go of a balloon in a parking lot before or have kids, right? And they were super excited for the balloon and then they let go of the balloon and there's nothing you can do and you're watching this thing just go up forever and ever. It just seems like it's going to keep going all the way until space or something and hit, a, hit the USS space station or something. You know, it just goes, goes up forever. That's all that's being said here, that the smoke is rising high. It's not saying the fire burns forever because, again, the people who go through that fire perish, okay? So those who end up rejecting God's message of mercy at the end of time are going to receive God's judgment. Now, here's an important point, though. It's not that the people are the object of God's wrath. They've aligned themselves or adjoined themselves to the object of God's wrath. And the object of God's wrath is sin. There's a big difference here. God is not looking for reasons to get at people. God's beef from the beginning is sin. His issue and his greatest struggle sin. We talked about this actually in our third message together, that God has a real dilemma on his hands. The very thing that God hates the most, which is sin, sin is living inside of what he loves the most, which is us. us. So God's wrath is poured out full strength on the source of the problem, sin. The issue is there will be people, unfortunately, who will not relinquish their hold upon sin and in turn will have to be destroyed with it. Are you with me tonight? It's not that God is willfully looking to get rid of people. He made them to love them and enjoy them forever. But if they're not going to forsake their allegiance to the thing that God has to destroy for the sake of the health of the overall body, like a cancer cell, he's going to have to cut that thing out. If there's anything that's forming any form of sympathy with it, it's got to go too. You may lose some muscle mass. You may lose some, some other form of important tissue or, or pieces of an organ. But it's better to have a living body at the end of the day than to let that thing grow. Are you understanding? The whole purpose of hell is to eradicate sin from the universe forever. And this is what it's going to have to look like. Unfortunately, people will be lost in this. But it's not because God didn't do his part or that God didn't want them. He's honoring their choice to not be with him. Does that make sense? That's the difference. Okay? So, 
God is not responding to the people, but the thing that's destroying these people and what they will not let Christ take away. If you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, we're told that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. The issue with the wicked at the end of time is that they have not allowed Christ to become sin for them. So they have to become sin for themselves. Are you tracking with me? So God is not angry at these people, but at sin. And they've rejected his sacrifice. They've made themselves sin. And in turn, they'll receive the wrath of God with sin. But what do we do about this phrase that seems to imply forever? Well, it's hyperbole. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 7, it says this, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual morality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, example, suffering the vengeance of what type of fire? Eternal. Eternal fire. Now, this is a super important point. What the Bible has just said is that what happened to the people in Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19... What happened to them is an example of eternal fire. Now, if I were to get on a plane today and fly over to the Middle East to where Sodom and Gomorrah were, would I still find a roaring fire in that area of the world? Is that like the eighth wonder of the world? No. Well, what happened to that fire? It burned up, right? When you have a campfire or you have something that fire is burning, it only burns as long as there is fuel available. Once it's burned up what the fuel was, the fire ceases to exist, right? It peters out and just stops. This is what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the book of Jude is telling us that this is the same way the destruction of the wicked is going to happen. There will be a fire that comes from heaven that destroys them, and the results of that fire are eternal. They are lost eternally, and there's another tie to the eternal part we'll see here in just a moment. But are you understanding the difference here? Right? The ramifications for the wicked, the death of the wicked, is eternal. There's no turning back. They never live again. The ramifications are eternal in nature. Okay? And besides, how could the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth be a happy, enjoyable place if people are burning in misery outside of the city gates at infinitum? How could that possibly be a place of delight and peace and joy? That can't be the case, right? And what God is doing is restoring what was lost in Eden. You know what the word Eden means? It means pleasure. Well, would it be pleasurable to watch people being burned alive forever outside of the city? Of course not, okay? But Jude is not the only person that makes this application. Peter also makes this application in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, "...in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes." Right? Now, can ash burn? No. No, ash is the result of all of the fuel being gone. Right? It's just turned into carbon. Okay? Making them, it says, "...condemn them to destruction, making them what?" An example. An example to who? To those who afterwards are going to live ungodly, would that be the lost? Yes, right? It's going to be the same scenario, okay? It's turned into ashes. It's been completely destroyed. So those who accept the mark of the beast and, obey and, and disobey God, they don't have any rest, right? And, and how many people can relate to the fact that when we were living lives outside of Christ, we had no rest day or night? We didn't have peace. That's what's being said here. Right? It's not that they're burning forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The point is they don't have any rest in this life because they've rejected the true source of rest. Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you rest. You can't have it apart from me. Okay? That's what's being stated here. They don't have peace when they're living or when they're judged, and they're not keeping the Sabbath. Right? They're not finding that precious privilege of finding true rest in Christ's accomplished work of salvation either. We see this again in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and a little bit longer than that uh, on our next slide. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. Not burn them forever, but burn them up. Says the Lord of hosts, They will leave them neither root nor branch, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings." 
right? And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. So the second coming of Jesus is a time of terror for the lost, but it's a time of rejoicing and healing for the righteous. Amen? We get those glorified bodies, no more pain, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor death, nor separation. Verse 3, you shall trample the wicked, for what are they going to be? Ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? Now, so Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. Jesus, we've used these verses before, but Jesus says this regarding the state of the judgment at the end of time. Okay? At the second coming of Jesus, the earth is split up into two camps, the righteous and the lost. Right? That's basically the two classes of people. And Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 25 of the sheep and the goats. Okay, the sheep are on the right side, the goats are on the left side. And he says to the goats on the left, then he said to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse, into the everlasting fire, prepared for who? The devil, the devil and his angels. Now, do you think that what God is saying here is that I gave him a new job? I mean, I know that he was supposed to be standing by my throne in heaven. He didn't do good a job at that. So I put him down here and I employed him to torture my people throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Do you really think that's what God means by Matthew chapter 25, verse 41? When I prepared it for the devil and his angels, I gave him a new job? No, it's to destroy him. It's to destroy the source of sin from the universe. Okay? And, and a lot of this view, by the way, of hell comes from Greek mythology. This idea of the, of the underworld and the caverns under the earth. That whole idea of platonic dualism, that you have a soul that lives forever, either up above or down below. This is all coming from Greek thought, not coming from biblical thought. God is not saying that people are burning forever in the caverns of the earth and that the devil who got kicked out of heaven is still one of my paid employees who's torturing the very people I created to love me forever. Absolutely not. Like That's an affront to logic, let alone love. God doesn't operate that way, okay? And that's not what he's saying here. So the concept of hell was to destroy sin and its source. He's trying to be as precise as possible, like a surgeon removing cancer to save the body, okay? And so he's trying to eradicate that from the universe, and he's doing it like a surgeon, carefully cutting away and separating the sin. But if we refuse to let go of the sin and let him separate us from it, He's not going to risk the health of the entire body or the universe for the sake of those cells that don't let go of the cancer. Are you with me? It's going to have to go. He doesn't want this. The Bible says this is a strange act of God. And he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I don't want to do this. But I'm going to give them what they want at the end of the day because love doesn't seek its own. Love ultimately gives people what they want. And so Jesus dies for the sins of humanity, and there are people who will not respond to that. And out of love, he gives them the free choice to have what they want. Okay? So, Matthew chapter 25 and verse... Oh, by the way, where does your name show up in this verse? Are you, are you anywhere to be found in here? Is humanity anywhere to be found in here? It says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the fire, prepared for humanity, the bad guys, the devil and his angels. Is that what it says? Hell was only prepared for the devil and his angels. We were never meant to be there, beloved. No humans were ever supposed to be there because we were supposed to be saved. That even when Adam and Eve fell in Genesis chapter 3, the first thing God did was preach the gospel. They could believe by faith in their promised seed who would come and save the world so that none needed to have been lost. But unfortunately, many will be. But that's not God's fault. That's God honoring their decision. You see the difference? Okay? So we're not supposed to be there. Here's where we're supposed to be in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. And when was it prepared for you? From the foundation of the world. This is the only place we were meant to be. It's the only place you were ever meant to be. Hell was prepared for the devil and the other evil angels. He has the kingdom in mind for us. Now, we made a point earlier that the ramifications of the fire are eternal. They will eternally cease to exist. But that's not the only thing that's being alluded to here when it comes to the idea of the fire being eternal. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29 says that our God is a consuming fire. That God himself, that sin is a combustible material in the presence of a holy God. And this is why the righteous cannot come into the presence of God without the covering of Jesus, 
right? Or why th- th- those who have sinned, why I should say sin can't be in the presence of God, right? We need a covering. We, we need a fireproof jacket. That's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We need a life that we have not lived. We need the death, burial, resurrection, and power of Jesus. So God himself is a consuming fire, and he's always revealed himself in a veiled form to his people after the fall. Even when Moses came down from communing with God, he didn't see God's full glory, and yet Moses had to veil his face, if you remember in the Old Testament. God's unveiled glory is a consuming fire, especially for sin. And the judgment of hellfire is at a time when God fully reveals himself to not only the righteous, but also to the wicked. It's the grand and full disclosure, okay? And we see this in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. And then it has this interesting statement. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Now, most people would assume it's the wicked that dwell in the fire. But look what the Bible says. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppression, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Who does the Bible say dwells in the presence of the everlasting fire? It's the righteous. We're dwelling in the presence of God, who himself is a... Is a uh, What's the word that he uses here? A consuming fire in Hebrews chapter 12. Okay, it continues. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks, meaning the righteous. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. And then it says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. You'll be able to see God in his full and grand disclosure and not be afraid because you're covered in the righteousness of Jesus, right? You're clothed in Christ's garb of righteousness We don't have to be afraid to be in the presence of God. We can come boldly into His presence. It's the wicked that should be afraid, not the righteous. And the source of the fire is eternal, not the duration of the fire for the wicked. Do you see the difference? That's what the Bible is alluding to here. Okay? So, a friend of mine has a statement he makes when he covers this topic that maybe the wicked don't burn forever, but the fire does. And, and maybe we're the ones who burn forever. We're the ones who dwell and love and live with God forever. Not in a bad sense, right? That your heart burns in a good way, as Pastor Doobie was talking about last week. That good kind of heartburn, right? We can live and dwell in the presence of God forever without being afraid. And Jesus says this in Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There is no cloudy language here. When they say destroy, they mean destroy. When they say devour, they mean devour. Okay? The whole person is destroyed here. Okay? Then going to Matthew chapter 26. Then Jesus, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, we talked about this in our third night together, when Jesus came with him to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Jesus is alluding to the fact that he is starting to die already. Now, how many lashings has Jesus received at this point? None. How many beatings has he received at this point? How many hours has he been on the cross at this point? And yet he's already to the point of death. Why? Well, he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What cup is Jesus referring to here? It's the same cup that the wicked will have to drink in the resurrection of condemnation. It's the cup of God's unmingled wrath. And Jesus himself is having to go through this experience. Why? So that you will never have to. Someone has to pay the price. And what Jesus came to do was to pay the price for all of us so that none need go through that experience of being completely separated from God and receiving the wrath of God to the full. 
Jesus is going through this. He's dying that death so that we don't have to. Jesus takes upon himself our punishment so that we can live in the presence of the consuming fire clothed in his righteousness. Remember, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, clothed in Christ's spotless garb of righteousness. But this is a profound point, beloved, and I hope you don't miss this. Before anyone goes through the hell experience, which is complete separation from God the Father, Jesus, who is God, goes through it first. That's justice, beloved. Jesus goes through this before anyone else will have to, so that no one else would have to. And I love this picture of God because we keep seeing that God is not asking things of you and of me that he himself was not willing to deal with. Amen? Amen. He himself was willing to go through with this experience so that none of us would have to, and that those who do, he understands what that's going to be like. And so again in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11, say to them, as I live, now how long has God lived? From eternity past and for eternity future, as I live, which is from everlasting to everlasting, says the Lord God, I have how much pleasure in the death of the wicked? No. no pleasure in this. I don't like this. I want the wicked to turn from his ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Most of Christianity today has painted a picture of hell before the world that says that God is looking over your shoulder, waiting for you to mess up, and is going to punish you vindictively forever for the sins committed in a short lifetime. But the Bible tells us that Christ took that punishment. Christ took our death. He died in our place so that we can have eternal life, and He pleads with us, why will you not live? Beloved, there are so many people in the world today who are refusing to believe in Jesus because they think that Jesus signs off on this idea that people will be tortured forever for a short span of time of life they lived on this earth. And that is not the teaching of the Bible, and that is not the position of Jesus. So your beef with Jesus isn't a beef with Jesus at all. It's a beef with the distortion of God's true character of love through bad theology. Are you with me? Maybe what you're rejecting, maybe the very God that you're rejecting doesn't even exist. I could believe in a God who wouldn't do such an insane and grotesque thing. Well, guess what? The God of the Bible would never do that. Would you give him another chance? Are you tracking with me tonight, guys? This is so important. This teaching of eternal torment is an affront to the character and nature and love of God. It is a satanic attack against God's character. Satan is taking his character attributes and projecting them onto God through bad theology in this world, teaching people that God is a monster. God claims to be love, but he's got a very special place for you if you don't love him back, and it's going to be horrible, and you'll never get out, and he's going to delight in doing so. That is not the picture of the God of the Bible. Amen? I don't want to believe in a God like that. I have no desire to do that. That's disgusting. God is righteous. He is just. He is fair. He is going to give firm and full dealings with those who reject God. And it's not because he wants to do this, but he's got to do it. Right? This, is, this is a strange act for him, but the point is, God is not palliating or taking sin lightly, but he's also not this atrocious monster either. He is perfectly balanced, perfectly reasonable. He will give people what they want. And if he would take those people to heaven against their will, it would be hell for them. Because heaven is a place of other-centered, unselfish love. And they are obsessed with themselves. That's why they don't want to be there, right? I would rather do me, get mine, do life my way, than submit to someone that I don't think I can trust. Even though he's proven himself trustworthy. So he will do the most fair thing in the world and turn them over to the desires of their heart and let them have eternity without him. They will just cease to exist. And I think that's the most fair and just thing that God can do of the options available to him. So why will you not relinquish your hold upon sin? God is trying to separate us from sin so that we're not caught in the destruction of that sin. 
There's nothing in this world, beloved, that is worth holding on to that will keep you away from Him forever. It's not worth it. Why will you perish? The world has been painted a horrible picture of God through the popular teaching of hell. But I love this in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12. It says, Therefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, He suffered where? Outside of the gate. Jesus suffered outside of Jerusalem. Why? So that you don't have to suffer outside of Jerusalem. He doesn't want to lose you guys. I suffered outside of Jerusalem for you so that you don't have to go through this. But will you respond tonight? That's the question, beloved. That's the million dollar question. Will you take him at his word? Will you believe what he said? C.S. Lewis has this beautiful statement in The Great Divorce. He says, there were only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it is open. Amen? I want to close with one more story here, one brief illustration that some people wrestle with on the topic of hell. How many people have heard of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? You ever heard of this, this parable, the rich man and Lazarus? If you haven't, that's okay. Someone may bring this up as you're sharing what you're learning. I think it's an important point to make. If you've got a Bible accessible to you, go to Luke chapter uh, 16. Luke chapter 16, and it's in verse 19. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. I just want to do this briefly, uh, just to give... uh, This is probably one of the most common objections to what we've shared with you tonight. Some people would refer to this as annihilationism. We believe in the complete annihilation of the wicked, not the eternal burning of the wicked. But in Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, I just want to read through this parable with you briefly, address it, and then we'll close. Okay? says, there was a certain rich man, so Jesus is telling a parable here. Now, some will say that this is not a parable, and it can't be a parable because it uses a proper name, as we're about to see, and no parables that Jesus told used a proper name. While it's true that no parable with a proper name is used apart from this one, there's a very good reason why he does use a proper name. This is not a true story, it's a parable, and he uses this name for a reason. And I think this is so powerful, and I hope you're able to track with me in this. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was doing very well. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the master's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels, where? To Abraham's bosom. Now, this seems like parabolic language to me because I don't believe that heaven is a large male chest. Okay, first of all. Okay, this is hyperbole, right? This is parabolic language that's being used, but I'll I'll continue. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, Jesus, by the way, is using a story that people told in his day. Okay, he's using a story that they're acquainted with and using it to communicate his purpose, not signing off on a theology that distorts his own character. That's not what's happening here. He's using a story they could relate to that was already being told in his day and making a profound and convicting point to the religious leaders of his day. So it was that uh, in verse, uh, the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, verse 23, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, This also is very parabolic in nature. It's not a clear story because imagine what hell would be like if you could stare at people in heaven, enjoying the glories of heaven, and you're not there, first of all. And second of all, imagine that also means that people who are in heaven are constantly staring at people who are tortured in hell. Would that be an enjoyable place? No. No. And would living on a grown man's chest be an enjoyable experience? No. No. Okay. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the fin- his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I have another question for you. Do you really think one drop of water will do you any good when you're being burned alive? No. The water probably won't even reach your tongue. It will evaporate before it gets there. Okay? Again, 
this is parabolic, this is hyperbole, it's being used here. Okay? But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. The roles have been reversed. And besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed, so that he cannot pass from there to you, uh, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. So he says, all right, fine. But I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send them to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Jesus is dealing with some serious issues here, okay, with the religious leaders in his day. The rich man is talking about the religious leaders. They were faring sumptuously every day and showing no mercy to the poorer classes of society, to the sick in society, and to the suffering in society, the people who looked like Lazarus. They felt like we're blessed of God because their view in their day was, if you're wealthy, you're blessed of God. If you're healthy, you're blessed of God. And if you're sick, you're being cursed by God. And if you're poor, you're being cursed by God. That was their view. So Jesus is going in on this view and saying, your riches in the here and now don't mean that much in heaven. Right? That's not how this actually works. They had very great riches, and they were not sharing with the poor classes of the people around them. But the people who were suffering among society were closer to the kingdom of heaven than they were. Jesus went so far as to say that the prostitutes and tax collectors are going to heaven before you are. That's a heavy statement, isn't it? He's making the same statement here, that this guy who was seemingly overlooked by you is favored in heaven. So the guy gets that he's in trouble, and he makes this point, well, then go send someone back from the dead to tell these religious leaders what needs to happen. And the response is, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't even listen if somebody's raised from the dead. Now, who was the guy that he said to be raised from the dead to go tell them? Lazarus. Did Jesus raise anybody who was named Lazarus in his ministry on earth? Yeah, no. Yes, he did. And did the religious leaders believe in Jesus as a result of that miracle? No. no. That's why a proper name is used in this parable. Jesus is literally calling his shot before he takes it. I'm going to raise somebody from the dead. His name is Lazarus, and you're still not going to believe in me. And your punishment will be just. That's the point that's being made here. Has that made sense? Okay, so someone comes and says, yeah, yeah, but the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and it's not a parable because he used a proper name. No, there's a very important reason why he used a proper name. It was to get in the Pharisees and Sadducees' business. And you know why? Because he wanted to save them too. Amen? Amen. And in turn, they tried, they, it, it literally says it in Scripture, that they now want to try to kill Lazarus because people are believing in Jesus because of Lazarus. They didn't believe in Jesus. They got to get rid of the proof that Jesus is who he claims to be. We got to kill this guy too. They didn't, but they were plotting to. They killed Jesus because he's causing a problem, and they want to kill that guy too. So anyway, this is a super, super important point, but has this study made sense this evening? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. The clear biblical teaching is that hell is a temporary experience after the thousand years have taken place, after the second coming of Jesus, and all the wicked will be punished at the same time, they will be burned up, they will cease to exist forever, and the righteous will live with God forever, well beyond the thousand years, filling a new heavens and a new earth. Because all of heaven actually moves here. The new, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth, and this becomes the center of the universe. The one planet that rebelled now becomes the centerpiece of the entire universe. Amen? Amen. And I love what this teaches about God, that when God gets a hold of something, He makes it even better than it was before. Amen? Amen? He can do that with your life, beloved, but will you let Him? That's the question. So grab your appeal cards, grab your decision cards. Uh, each of you should have received those when you came into this evening's meetings. Grab your pens. And here are the, the five choices for this evening. Okay? Got your decision cards. Number one, 
I accept the biblical teaching that hell is a one-time event that results in the destruction of the lost. That's number one. Okay, I accept the biblical teaching that hell is a one-time event that results in the destruction of the lost. Number two, I want to be inside of the walls of New Jerusalem on that day of final judgment. I want to be inside of the city, not outside of that city. Number three, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I want to be with you. I want to be inside of that city. Lord, save me. Number four, I've got questions. Any questions about this topic? We want to know. We want to help you with that. Number five, I've got a prayer request or any other request. If you'd like someone to come visit you in your home, to pray with you, to, ask, to answer your questions, that's what we're here for. I would be happy to do that. Okay? I don't want to force that, but I'd be happy to do so. If you're interested in that, just let us know. Okay? We'd be happy to do so. So those are the five things. Tomorrow evening, we're going to deal with the topic of a new birth. A new birth. But I'd like to close with a word of prayer. God in heaven, thank you for presenting to us a clear picture from Scripture of the chronology of what happens before, during, and after the second coming of Jesus, as we've looked at the past few nights. And Lord, we want to be inside of that city. And God, there are people in our life right now that we know that right now would find themselves outside of that city. And God, there's still time to do something about that. And I pray that you would stir our hearts to ensure that we can share this message of hope that we're finding from what we're learning night after night after night, and that we would convince them to set foot inside of this true place of refuge, to abide under the shadow of the Almighty, to allow themselves to be covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and to be spared from the coming judgment of condemnation. God, we want that. We don't want to see them destroyed outside of that city. We want them in the city. Use us, O oh God, to tell that story of truth to them, we pray. Cover our sins with the blood of Jesus and fill us with your spirit as well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.